when you sing, Laura, I just get hit in the heart. It's just, thank you. Who are you called to be? You're going to be hearing that question over and over again from all different sides as this year progresses. And the truth is, if you have ever struggled with answering the question, who are you called to be, all you have to do is check the fire in your belly. The fire, the passion, the great love, the calling, it's all the same. It's what lights you up and says yes. We've been exploring the hero's journey throughout this year, and one of the things that we've noticed is that refusing the call is a common theme. And we refuse the call for various reasons. A lot of it has to do with I'm not good enough, tall enough, rich enough, pretty enough, you name it, you know, whatever. And um, I was reading an article uh, by an artist, and her name is Dale Mykoff, and she had been has been an artist from the time she was a little girl. It was her calling. It was the fire in her belly. It was her passion. And her dream was to, was to become an artist and travel the world and, you know, do all these things. However, her mother's aspiration or inspiration for her, aspiration, was that she would marry young, that she would have lots of children, and maybe live next door, you know, and that they would all live happily ever after. And that was her mom's dream for her, because that was her mom. Her mom married young, had lots of kids, stayed in the same town. Uh, but, you know, Dale was like, no way, you know, I'm going to get out there. And so she applied uh, to go to the Art Institute in Chicago, and she got accepted. So she gets the letter and all of a sudden, what starts happening? All the reasons why not. The not good enough messages start coming in. And even though she's been accepted to the Art Institute in Chicago, she starts thinking, I'm not talented enough. I've never really lived away from my family in another city before. I don't think I can leave my family. And I don't think I can afford this. And guess what? Her mom agreed with her. Her whole family agreed with her and said, you know, you're right. You haven't really ever moved away and lived in another city, and it is awful expensive. So I don't know. I think maybe you should stay here. And so she did. And she began to follow in her mother's footsteps, in a sense, where she married her high school sweetheart. And although she didn't live next door, she lived 12 miles away. And she had her child, and, you know, pretty soon her art was relegated to the basement, you know? But still, it was a passion, it was a fire in her belly. So she'd go down to the basement, she'd bring up her art supplies, she'd start painting, and then pretty soon it would go back down to the basement once again. So uh, fast forward about five or six years, she's got a, a five-year-old child, and she doesn't say where she lives, but I'm assuming they're living in Detroit because she said the auto industry crashed. And it was where she and her husband both worked. They both lost their jobs. And so they decided to move down south where he got a job. And she didn't work. And she stayed at home and took care of her child, which actually freed her up to pursue that passion again. And the passion was her art. And so she pulled it all out of the basement. She began uh, painting once again. And it has blossomed into a career for her where she uh, puts it out into the world and she is um, selling. And she said every now and then, you know, the creative spark uh, becomes so strong that she must pursue that. She said, I am now doing what I love, and there are no words that can express the happiness and the freedom in moving forward with your dream no matter how old you are, no matter how many obstacles are thrown your way. The fire in our belly can be the call to be an artist, a mom, a teacher, a songwriter, a singer, a preacher, a builder, a writer, a cook, a lawyer, you name it. There are as many callings in this room as there are people times 10. Oprah Winfrey said it this way. She said, passion is energy. Feel the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. What is it that excites you in this life? 
Charles Fillmore called this same energy, he called it zeal. Zeal is one of our 12 powers and it is the impulse to life. It is the impulse forward. Without zeal, we become depressed. Without zeal, we become stagnant. We become stuck. We become, you know, a rerun. We become the same. And when we combine the power of zeal with the power of love, then we can light the world on fire. I've already introduced you to Gail Donnelly and her call, her book, The Mission of Marianne. And I spoke with her this morning and I said, so has writing been a calling for you your whole life? And she said, yes, I have always loved to write. But really what's behind her book, she said, is a great love for Jesus. And that, that uh, this book was written in that connection and her love and her calling uh, with Jesus. So... Our calling takes all different forms. So what happens if you have a calling, but maybe you're not so good at it, you know? I mean, I was reading an article about a, a guy named Paul Cott. He lives in, uh, in the UK, <clears throat> and he loves football, soccer. I'm going to call it football for the sake of this, but it's soccer. Now he played it in high school, he played it in college, but he, was, but he wasn't good enough to ever go pro, but he still, his fire in his belly, his passion in life was football. And so he ended up getting any job that he could get. He sold popcorn for a while, you know, he did a little bit of this and a little of that, and it was like, yawn, you know, life was very boring because he still was passionate about football. And he said one day his friend called him from France and he says, I have all this football memorabilia. Would you help me sell it? And he said, sure. So he helped his friend sell this football memorabilia and it just set him on fire. He was so excited, he was so happy. And he ended up opening his own shop <clears throat> that sells football jerseys and football uh, memorabilia. And he just opened a shop in Manchester where there are 40 million people that cruise through this town. And he said he gets to surround himself with people who love football. He said, why am I doing this? I am meeting my heroes, people I never would have dreamed I would have met. And I am spending each day doing what I love, living and breathing football. So he couldn't play it, but he could take that passion that he has for football, and he could buy jerseys, and he could buy the balls, and he could sell them, and he could hang out and connect with all these people so that he can talk and live and breathe. And he says, you know what? I work 14 hour, 16 hour days, and I don't care. And I'm gonna pour every life force, every scent, every breath I have into this business because I love it. Now the truth is, there are no guarantees that we will have outer success in the world just because we are pursuing our passion. But you know what? That's not our job. Our job is to create. Our job is to be a co-creator of God. Our job is to pursue our passion and put it out there whether the world celebrates it or sees it or not. Because if we don't, what happens? It just kind of ends up staying in our head. It's kind of a good idea. It'd be kind of fun to do this maybe, but it never manifests. It never goes anywhere. One of the popular movies that's out right now is F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. And it has been this book that has survived for so many years. It has become kind of a, a part of the American psyche. And what I didn't know until recently was that F. Scott Fitzgerald couldn't sell that book. It was a commercial failure. In fact, he would go to the bookstores and he would buy the book because nobody was buying it. And he was like, all right, I'm gonna make it look like there's some book sales. So he'd go in and buy 10 copies and leave. And when he died, he considered himself a failure. In fact, when he got a telegram about the sales, he signed a, a letter, a depressively yours, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And yet, the book now has taken on a life of its own. His job was to create it. 
and it wasn't met by the world at the time. Perhaps it wasn't meant to. I like to listen to uh, books on tape. I like to read autobiographies. It's, uh, it's like getting inside someone's mind and seeing how they, uh, what their lives are like. And for some reason, I picked up the autobiography of Rob Lowe at the, at the library. You know Rob Lowe? He was in the West Wing. He's very cute. He's very handsome. And I didn't know a lot about his life. But when he was 18 years old, he was in a movie called The Outsiders. <clears throat> and it was uh, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Rob Lowe was cast as the main character in the book, The Outsiders. His name was Soda Pop, and the whole book centered around his character. So it was, it was like this amazing thing to get a starring role when you're only 18 years old. And he goes on all this detail about the screen tests and getting it, and there's this one scene at the end where he has to cry and break down, and he does like eight takes, and he's thinking, oh my God, I don't think I could do this again. I don't think I can break down and cry again. And then Francis Ford Coppola comes out and goes, you know, that was really good. Now we're going to go in for your close-up for the next scene. And he's like, are you kidding me? I just cried, you know, eight times in a row, and it was a long shot. Now it's a close-up. He did it. I mean, he said the cast came around him, and they, they supported him and did it. And then, of course, they have to wait for the movie to come out, and it takes a while, and he's not invited to all the screenings, and he doesn't know why. And then eventually, there's a private screening, and he can come. And he sits by himself in the back, and the movie comes up, and all of a sudden, Matt Dillon is on the screen. And he's like, okay, because Matt Dillon and Tom Cruise and Emilio Estevez and all these guys are in the movie. But Matt Dillon's part doesn't show up until 20 minutes into the book, and he's like, oh, it's out of sequence. They're miss something because my character is not there. All of the, you know, the main characters aren't even in the first part of the movie. And guess what? They don't show up until so much later. And the whole movie had been recut and his part became a periphery part instead of the centerpiece. And I don't even know that his crying scene made the movie. So he was absolutely devastated. Now I share this story because, you know, I don't know how many of us are in the movies. I've never had this experience. Probably not a lot of us in this room have. But have you ever felt like sometimes your life ends up on the cutting floor? You know, you give it your best stuff, you put it out there, and it's like, hey, it didn't even make the movie. You know, it's not, it's not even there. It's on the cutting floor somewhere. Now, the truth is that that movie catapulted his career and Tom Cruise and all the rest of them into stardom. So when you look back, it doesn't really matter that much. However... Again, his calling, his passion, his fire in his belly was to be an actor. That's what it was. And to, to feel that he put in his best stuff and then the world, not only does the world not recognize it, the world never even got a chance to see it. They never even got a chance to look at it. So what are you passionate about? What is the fire in your belly? What is your calling? And the truth is, we don't have just one thing that we're passionate about. We don't have just one thing that is our calling. Because you, you may have a passion as a writer, but you may also be a teacher. You may have a passion as a parent, but you also have a passion as a songwriter or a dancer. You know, I love cooking. You know, and, and who's to say that my passion for cooking doesn't make me a better minister? Or that being uh, my passion for ministry doesn't make me a better mother? Because the truth is, as we give our energy and attention to that which excites us, to that which says yes to us, it feeds all the other areas of our lives. <coughs> so in this moment, I would like you to think about those things that you are passionate about in your life. And I would like you to think of at least three, you don't have to share it with anybody, but I'd like you to think about at least three or maybe five. What are those things that you have fire in your belly about? Does everybody have at least three? Raise your hand if you have at least three. Okay. 
So how many of these three things have you been actively engaged in in this last week? Let me see. How about the last month? And how many of you need to re-engage a little bit and, and, and call that forth once again? So what I would invite you to do is to pick one of those things that, you're gonna, that you are passionate about, that puts your, your, your soul on fire, and do that thing this week, or at least within the next two weeks. Because we're each called, uh, we're each being called to something, and it's so easy sometimes to let go of it and say, well, like the, the woman who got the letter from the Art Institute, well, I'm not, I don't have enough money, I don't want to really live far away from home. And the thing is, sometimes our friends and our families around us will say, yeah, I don't think so either. You probably ought to stay close to home. I was sharing at the first service that my dad's dream for me was not just to live next door, but to live in the house and to stay there until I found a husband. And he, was, and he said, oh, and the factory just opened up down the street. I think you could get a job there. You, you could walk to work. You could walk to work and you could come home and you know, everything would be just fine. And he tries, anyway. So, <laughs> obviously I didn't follow that path. And I think it's also a call for our friends and our kids. You know, what is it that sets their souls on fire? What is it that they're passionate about? And how can we support that? How can we call that forth within them? So as we again continue this year, it is about who are you called to be? An artist, a mom, a teacher, a preacher, a builder, a cook, a writer, let me hear some of the things that you are called to be because each one of us has more than just one. Speak it out. Artist. Artist. Writer. Architecture. Architecture. Mom. Educating the innovator. The environment. Preacher. Caring friend. Is that what you said? Did you say caring friend? Yeah, that's a big one. That's a, that's a big one. You know, you may refuse the call, but that fire still burns. You may take that calling, and you may put it down in the basement for a while, but it's not going to stay there. You're going to have to go down and bring it back up again. You're going to have to bring up those materials, dust off the, that book, get your pens out. Dale Mykoff, the artist, said, am I scared? Now that she's a full-time artist, she said, am I scared? Of course. I still hold my breath before I show someone a piece of my work. But she does it anyway. She puts it out there because the idea is that we are co-creators of God and it is not for us to know how it will be received. That's not our job. Howard Thurman said it this way. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go out and do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Perhaps the love of dancing may fuel your writing. What makes you come alive is the fire in your belly. What makes you come alive is pursuing your passion. It ignites zeal, which is the call to life. And zeal, combined with love, is a powerful force that moves mountains, writes books, cooks meals, raises children, changes the world. So take your passion and the fire in your belly and make it happen.